streaming live from the territory of Toronto, which is grounded in the treaty of a dish with one spoon and home to some of the most diverse population in Canada. I'm from Treaty One territory in the heartland of the Métis Nation, the place where the great waterways meet and the heart of Turtle Island. I'm excited to host the third Nui Blanche talk series, thinking through public space in a time of COVID and how will people return to public space and public art. We have an incredible lineup. We've been having some technical difficulties, so bear with us as we as we all get aligned onto the screen. Um, starting with uh, incredible people such as Ambreen Inet, Programming Supervisor for the City of Cultural Events at the City of Toronto, who has worked with Nui since her inception of working with the city. Dr. Jeanine Marcheseau, who's a professor of cinema and media arts at York University and a past curator of Nui. Mazar Mordovitz, President and CEO of Taz Design and the, chair of, and the Chair of the Board of Directors for the Bentway. We have Julian Christian Lutz, professionally known as Director X, past artist of Nui. And we have El Seed, who's also a past artist of Nui, who works in calligraphy to spread the message of peace and unity in our shared human existence. Our past talks have reflected on, st on, st on the status of monuments and how the public is wanting to recreate, or as Negon said, make new little additions, you know, maybe some handprints over certain people's faces, or altogether remove colonial and racist statues to replace them to tell stories that have been silenced or ignored. Earlier this week, we discussed the struggle for the performing arts as we continue to have to social distance and how this impacts performers and all of us who get who are witness to this work. Tonight's talk will focus on the current pandemic of COVID-19 and the necessities of reconfiguring audience, audiences and processes of public participation. We look at examples of how each of you have participated in public art while offering historical and experiential analysis of how spaces have shifted to accommodate our changing communities. We'll also investigate how this spatial fluidity might respond to the current environment and public restrictions. This talk will address the global concerns about the future of public art, both in the material and speculative resolutions to bring forth an emergence of new and radical alternatives to participating in public space. How will we recover? How will art play a role in moving us forward into the present day and into our future? Speakers will consider the ways in which public art can reproduce relationships between artists and their communities, artworks and their audiences, and reflect on the important work they're doing in our current climate. As I've said before, and many people before me, Nui Blanche is the largest public exhibition in North America and has totally shifted to a virtual event. We're excited to break new ground with our AR and VR reality works. But for me, the big missing is connectivity, which is essential. And I know many of our speakers would agree that the arts are critical to our mental health and well being. I'm super excited to hear from each of you about how art can play a role in our recovery as a society. Mazar, would you like to kick us off? Sure, happy to. Um, thank you, and uh, great to be part of uh, such a great panel. Um, you know, I, th I think from at the intersection of city building and arts and culture, um, I think what is really, really critical and what we've been observing is the fact that as sort of social creatures, we need that connectivity and the nuances of, of what we're facing with COVID today have highlighted sort of the value and the importance of public space and the ability to actually gather uh, in spaces that we have very often taken for granted. Um, I look to, to the work that the Bentway has been doing and, and sort of the role that the Bentway has been playing as an idea of how do you actually introduce these sort of spaces as spines in the construct of our cities and reimagining the way that we engage with these with these spaces, and and one of the one of the things that's been really critical for us at the Bent Way has been very rapidly iterating around the idea of of sort of very actively sort of testing, feel, sort of uh, experimenting, shifting very constantly and consistently. And I think that's one of the things that the power of artists in public space do is that they can deliver a message in such a broad way, in such an iterative and rapid way to try to respond to and bring together a lot of the questions that we're all facing, but through different mediums that connect with public in, in very different ways. And so the, the role of public space and the, and the critical function of artists to express what we're all going through is so, so profound and has been fundamentally highlighted in the times that we're in today. 
Yes, it's true. I was thinking maybe Janine, it might be a great time for you to add some, some thoughts to that. Yeah, I mean, Julie, I thought about your question, how um, will we return to public space after COVID? And uh, I think COVID has uh, really transformed public space. On the one hand, it has, I think, materialized it. I see, I see cinema spaces or public squares in films now, and I'm like, oh, I want that. <laughs> I want to touch that. Um, and I think it makes people really long for those spaces. And um, I do think that we're gonna demand different things of our cities now. We're gonna demand public space. Um, cities are gonna have to change uh, and have to adapt. Obviously, COVID, there's gonna be a cure, it's gonna go away, but there are gonna be other pandemics. So I, I, think, I think the way that we live in cities is gonna be really transformed. Um, and that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, and the world is uh, changing. It's, it's all, you know, it's exploding in painful and really exciting ways. What's going on with art now is transformative. It's temporary, it's ephemeral. There's nothing permanent, which is really exciting to say like, just, just adapt things. It's actually not just that. It's actually, it's, um, it's exploding. So this is, it's an incredible time for us to be reflecting on the role of public art um, to bring us together, but also to initiate and ignite uh, demands for better cities and spaces for us to be together. I think that it's going to be, I mean, I, I, I get excited when you say like it's exploding and in some ways it is, and in other ways, you know, people are just longing for some sort of connectivity. And I know that one of the artists that we have, Cheryl LaRondell, she actually made me a beautiful uh, face mask. And she said that she actually thought a lot about how we can't be um, in physical space the same way and touch the same way. And she said that she thought it through a kind of Cree concept and she actually sewed them all together so that we were all bound together in this kind of Cree concept of the world and thinking about that even though we couldn't necessarily be as, as intimate, we could actually be bound through our face masks. And it was such an interesting concept for me because I, you know, the, just what you're saying, it's like, there's so much excitement in terms of what we're kind of responding to because we're in such a global situation and people are, you know, invested in the current climate. Um, LC, do you have some really great projects? And I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, as, as an artist to work uh, uh, primarily on the on the public space, it's uh, actually, I don't want to say it's, uh, it's been difficult, but it's been a, a weird time for me, you know, because uh, what I love the most and what I enjoy the most is is the human interaction, you know, and, uh, and you know, for somebody who work in the public space who, who cannot actually, who, cannot go in the public space it's a, it's a bit uh, ironic but uh i uh, i've been you know uh, i i managed recently to uh to went back to the street and try to do not project as i used to do but uh, just to get the feeling of getting this kind of interaction because what i what i you know what i i love the most it's uh it's a human experience and this is uh actually for me uh one the only way you know one of the best way that i found you know art in the public space to uh, to connect and interact with uh yeah with community with strangers that become then after like uh friends i would say and uh and i remember like uh, two years ago exactly at this time you know i was uh, we were in dundas square uh testing the light you know uh, for for like the mirror of babel and uh, the installation that i created there and uh, yeah, it, it looks, it, it was so like so long ago and uh, it looks, it was like a kind of unreal, you know, because I, I, I watched the recently the video of the project and I saw like this huge crowd, like 
you know, all united in front of uh, in front of a piece, and I feel like it was uh, part of another world. So it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a bit difficult to accept that, but you know, I think uh, I think uh, I have to adapt, and everybody has to adapt. You know, it's a uh, we uh, it's a transition time, but uh, I'm not giving up. You know, I'm using all the time that I have today uh, to work on some of the new project that I'm I'm doing, and hopefully. Uh, as soon as as the world become normal, if he ever become as it used to be, like uh, I'll be back on the street. And it's also just to put it in context, uh, I'll see it. It's like four a.m. for you, so we really, really appreciate you yeah. coming to join us. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. We're having some technical difficulties with Julian's feed, and so we're not able to get him right now. So we'll we'll keep trying. We'll see what happens. Um, Ambreen, do you want to pick up the conversation? Sure. So I guess for me, I, I think a lot about how art can serve because, you know, we, I work for the city and I'm always thinking about the people. And I feel like, you know, this whole year we've been going through like a collective grieving process, you know, and we are going through like the stages of grief, you know, like anger, denial, frustration, um, negotiation and I think what art public art needs to do now is be a place a safe place for people to hold space uh, to be able to express uh, themselves and what's going on in the world you know with like you know all the injustices um, all the vulnerability that's coming out with COVID you know with Breonna Taylor with all BLM I think it needs to serve as that place and that space for people to feel and express themselves and to hold that grief. And so I think a lot about that now where before, you know, like the, you know, the message was a medium and we can get away with doing things that were a little bit more abstract. Now I'm thinking a lot about how do we put these issues, these feelings, you know, the things, the silence voices in the public sphere so people can grieve, you know, so people can feel validated in their emotions. Because I think what this year has done is made everybody vulnerable. Um, you know, and um, that's hard, but public art needs to serve as that place to sort of be that holder of emotion and eventually come to the point where it cradles that emotions and then we can start making room for healing and start looking at it in another, um, in another way in a little bit of time. But right now, we need to hold space for all the grieving that's going on in the world. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It just adds another layer to what we do and you know even if that's online or anything that we're doing is intervention based i think we need to be vocal and let people know their voices are their all of their voices and feelings matter um and so with that i've just been thinking about the role and responsibility of public art and how it can really serve as a catalyst you know for healing and the first part about it is stopping to acknowledge um, and so that's sort of where I'm at. And I would say, you know, given my 13 years of experience with Nui, the projects that I actually had the most difficulties with, you know, with challenges with, with artists, with technical things actually is what were the ones that were the, the most favorable. Like, you know, with Director X, we had a huge problem with Death of the Sun, as Janine knows, you know, the sphere exploded and three days and before we away. Had, <laughs> yeah, it was like pandemonium stress, but we all came together because of the fact that we were vulnerable and we became closer throughout that time. And same with El Cid, you know, we had some issues with travel, which I won't talk about, but we spoke to each other like 15 times a day to say, are you okay? You know, we're, get, we're in this together. And so I do hope that because we're all in this together, we're going to become closer and, and hopefully art can be the vehicle for that. And I think that's a good spot to kind of pick up, you know, how, why and how do we, how is connectivity achieved if we're all social distancing and we're not in public space? You know, how, how are we actually doing that? And I know that, you know, each of you are working on it in your own particular ways. But I know for me, one of the big things with working on the AR VR is that we wanted to really kind of recreate that feeling of being in public space and making that work exist with it, whether it's in your home or on your kitchen table or in your backyard or down the street from, from you in your neighborhood. And so, you know, we we're trying to think about ways of how do we get people connected 
you know, how do they, how do they relate to the work that, that we're thinking about? And, and connectivity is so much about, you know, just how you said we're in it together, but it's also about, you know, learning to talk to each other, to deal with some of those hard facts and truths that we don't want to have to actually say. And we've, we're watching that happen in our current climate right now. So I don't know if anybody wants to talk a little bit about um, how we're achieving connectivity, or maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're all just hiding in our own little bubbles. <laughs> yeah. Well, Julie, I'm, um, I'm really excited about the archive, the, the Nuit Blanche archive. I, you know, 14 years mm -hmm. of fantastic uh, international public art and, um, when we first talked about the possibility of, of bringing that archive together and making it available to the public, I, I sort of didn't really think it was possible. And, um, and then at the same time, I know that you've been talking to different artists about creating new kinds of, um, of interfaces. And I guess um, being a teacher, um, I've pivoted fairly quickly to a life on the internet, but I don't really, I feel it's an extension of the physical world. And, and I do think that we, um, we're being, we're innovating uh, new ways to live online, new kinds of interfaces, thinking about archives, not just as things of the past, but archives that come into the present and are changed through artists' engagements and, and evolve. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm also connected to a lot of film festivals. I just think what's happened with festivals has been quite revolutionary. I don't think they'll be going back, even post COVID. I think that it's opened up a space of participation uh, that wasn't there before, of uh, presentation, of discussion, um, that is really, really exciting and is only just at the very beginning. I think there's a lot more um, that's going to emerge from that. Oh, yeah. I'd be lying if I didn't say I sat and cried in my room for a couple of weeks, like in terms of like, you know, you're, you have this incredible opportunity. You know, Nui is so well known for making these kind of massive public interventions inside, you know, inside any building you want you know, and, and, and it's just such an incredible opportunity. And then at the same time, I was like, well, we can also lead the way and we can try doing it in a new innovative way to see how we can engage and get people connected. I'll see I think you're working on a, is it a coloring book project or am I getting this wrong? No, we, uh, I, I offer a coloring book, uh, book like during the COVID, you know, we, uh, I try to stay connected, you know, with uh, the different community that uh, I've been working with as well. Um, and I, uh, and actually we, we did, um, that was funny, but uh, I used the Zoom during the COVID to create a, to create a project where, uh, I don't know if you know, but on Zoom you can, uh, you can, oh, sorry, I did a mistake. You know, on Zoom you can use the virtual background uh, uh, and so we, I created this, you know, like, oh, uh, wow. <laughs> I, 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 you know, on, on, on one screen, then, you know, on, on one screen, you can have uh, 49 people on Zoom. So I invited like 48 people from all around the world uh, to be on a Zoom call at a certain time with each one had like one, one piece actually of, uh, of this, of this piece, you know, so this is a painting that I've done. So I cut it in 48 people. Oh, wow. Each person had a, had a piece. And so we had people from, from Canada to Nigeria, from Pakistan to the US, from Portugal to, uh, to uh, China. And, uh, and everybody was there at the same time. Uh, we had some technical issue because like uh, it was in April. So like five months ago, it was nobody, I think really mastered Zoom. And uh, <laughs> it, it was interesting, actually, to see how everybody, you know, still uh, everybody wanted to be part of it. And this is what I noticed with public art. Me, I, when I paint in the street, I always try to, um, it's different with the sculpture and the one we did uh, in, in Toronto. But when, for example, I paint a mirror, I like to invite members of the community uh, to, to help me, you know. And, uh, and the feeling that I get all the time is like people say, like, 
I want to be part of this. I want to be a, I want to come back maybe in 10 years and say like, yes, I was this little piece I painted, you know, like this uh, square of orange. And, uh, and yeah, doing this Zoom project was a way for me to, uh, I think to feel this kind of excitement that you, that I have sometimes when I do a project in the public space. And, uh, and then we, uh, and then we, we printed a, a lithograph out of the artwork that was created for this project. And we, and we sold it for, for two hospitals, one in France and one in Tunisia. And, uh, and yeah, so it was, uh, I think I, I tried to feel the same spirit that I have in the street. So, uh, we're facing new, new circumstances. And I think as a, as a social animal, uh, human being is always capable to adapt. So. I liked what you said, just that you're like trying to get the same spirit that you would when you'd be doing work in the streets. And I think that that's really resonates in terms of how, how we're thinking about it. Mazar, you guys are doing some really great work at the Bentway. You, you talked a little bit about it. I don't know if you want to expand about some of that work. I'll, uh, maybe what I, what I do is pick up on some of the comments on Brain made because I think one of the things that's critical right now is that ability to give people the space to express themselves. Uh, and I think that grieving is sort of the step, the first step towards recovery. And a big part of my own personal belief is that this is the new new. And then there is no sense of sort of the anticipation. The anticipation of the return is actually far worse than the opportunities of the future. And I look at the work that we did at the Bentway very early on. We launched a project called It's All Right, N it's All right Now. Yeah. And I think that was such a critical moment in actually really tapping in. And the project was, we went to, we did a, an artist call and we asked artists to, to provide the submission based on what they feel in the moment. And that's all they were asked to do. And then we took those, so those art pieces came back in, in a variety of different ways. And then we partnered with a series of media agencies and had those artworks displayed across the greater Toronto area on, on billboards. And for us, it was such an important moment around the idea of artists as a, as a vehicle to tap into sort of the societal sensibilities and using art as a way to express. And those expressions to us were, and the feedback we got from many of the artists is that it was their, it was their transition point. It was that moment where it was almost like, oh, finally, like I can get it out. I can get on with it now. And I think there is something so critically important in the way that artists are able to capture the sentiment in a moment of time in our society. And then in the moment that we're facing now, that while we're all sitting in our, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, in our apartments, that there's a way that, that, that me, social media can then become almost a vehicle to begin to try to create that connectivity. One of the things that I think is, is, is sort of a challenge that we face with this, however, is the, 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 the overarching sort of discussion that has been raised around sort of issues around social inequity around the systematic constructs that we need to break down. And one of the concerns I personally have is the fact that the, the extraordinary moment in, in public space and experiencing public art is the chance connections you make with people that you are not part of your system. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of that real challenge is how do we actually break down the system? We can all zoom within the, within, within the circles that we have, but the problem is how do we actually create the chance occurrences to connect with people that we wouldn't and trigger conversations that are unlikely, which are really where those sparks of magic happen, where, where new ideas are f sort of become sort of realized or perceptions get broken down. Um, and so I, it's almost sort of a, almost a question back in the context of the conversation, which I would love to sort of explore around with, with the group here, because I think everyone is really touching on some of those themes. But this idea of how do we actually break down things that are systematic? Because I think that's one of the most extraordinary things that's emerged out of COVID and has been sort of taken on in many different ways. Ami, um, you want to pick it up? <laughs> sure. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> well, listen, listen we're, we're, we're all stuck in these sort of systematic constructs, right? So like we can all zoom together, right? 
Um, so the, our networks will zoom, but how do we actually get outside of our networks? How do we get outside of the things that systematically we define for ourselves? Uh, and I think there's this, there's, you know, that to me, the magic of public space is the chance occurrences of meeting with people that we don't expect and striking up conversations we wouldn't expect to have. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now of being in a digital world is that the likelihood of those things is, is far, is, is to me, is, that's a serious significant constraint. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to sort of crack that nut in my own head. Of like, how do I actually sort of, you know, like I, I'm very fortunate you know, I'm in a position of leadership, so I've been asked to sit around this table. So I'm connecting with a new group of people, but like that, that's a very, from, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very privileged position. And I don't think that's like, oh, what's the big deal? So yeah, I'm getting to meet new people. Well, it's not the same. And, and I think that that's a problem, so. And I think it I'm, goes to the ideas of connectivity, right? How, yeah. how are we connecting in, because public space is those spaces where we connect you know, through your work networks, obviously, but also just random chance. And it's I think that that's chance. kind of the magic of public art. You know, just I uh, had a conversation with the with the mayor and he just said, I just like listening to the dialogue that's happening around me. So, you know, and you see that because public art does that in public spaces. And so I think that that's the, the bit of, and I think just how you said, it, it's like, you're still trying to figure out how do we get there? Want me to jump in here? I think in, in virtual spaces, you can have uh, chance meetings. I mean, gamers know that. Multi, <laughs> multiplayer platforms, that might not be, you might not be a, a gamer, but I'm going to a cocktail party uh, tomorrow, actually. And um, so it's been designed with different breakout rooms. And so it's not the same at all. But I do think that uh, virtual worlds are, they're being designed right now as we speak. And I don't know what they will be, but I, I think the idea of chance random encounters um, is, is people are, are really thinking about it and they have been thinking about it with games for sure. Um, I mean, I agree with Jean I, and um... I'm as well. Like, uh, yes, I do th on both accounts. Like, I think the virtual world is just beginning and we're not going to go back. Like I did a, I was on a conference and it was literally like this and uh, it was so good. Like, I felt like, why would everybody, you know, go out and spend all this money on these venues where I can just click through all of these things and I can just see everybody and we can connect. So in some ways it's really great. You know, I think the level of vulnerability that people are showing online is amazing. And honestly, in a way, I also feel like it's time to go within, you know, like, for example, I went home to Scarborough as soon as COVID hit. I was like, I want to go home. I want to be in a safe place. And I stood out in my parents' balcony and I kept looking at that green space thinking, this is why we need public art. Like, we need it so that it can feed our soul, that it, there's something for us to channel our emotion into. And I felt you know, a connection to public art in a way that I haven't felt in a long time. And that was on an individual basis. So I sort of feel like maybe it's okay to also, you know, as much as I miss the stories and the faces of wonder, maybe it's okay to sort of have people have, you know, personal connections with public art again. Like, I don't think we should stop doing them. But I think, you know, obviously we have to restrict the number of people but I think it's gonna create a different relationship to them so that when we all come back out again, we have something else to say. Yeah, I think it's gonna be hard. I think there's a, I think it's a big challenge because even when, you know, we talk a little bit about what does 2021 look like? What does 2022 look like? You know, how are we organizing in terms of, you know, um, creation of public artwork? You know, how do we, how do we even install it? you know, in, in ways of when we're thinking about how to be in that space. And I think that, you know, this is kind of going to be a new challenge. I don't know, Alcide, have you guys, have you guys been working on any public art projects right now? Uh, I am actually, you know, uh, like we, uh, I, I really see this period as a, as a bracket, you know, I try to stay positive and, uh, and I hope that you know, like at some point, uh, you know, we would be able to to go back to the street and uh, and to the public space and do do stuff maybe differently. So uh, 
I'm using actually like all the time that I didn't have before in the past six months to really focus and uh, and just get ready. So actually, me, I'm, uh, I'm on the starting block. I'm just waiting. Uh, uh, it's just I'm waiting for some of the borders to open. You know, like we are. Yeah. We had the uh, we had the project actually that we are planning to start uh, next week, like in ten days, in a in a, in a country of uh, in West Africa, and uh, and actually the border is not open to uh, foreigners, so like we just have to wait. But me, I'm I, I'm ready, you know, like I have everything ready in boxes, you know. I'm just uh, my passport is ready, I'm, everything is ready, the luggage is ready. I'm just I'm ready to to go, but. Uh, like I said, it's. Uh, I think I, I'm. I'm adapting, you know, and I think this is. Uh, uh, I was. I was really uh, rejecting this thing at the beginning. I was like, okay, this will just like two, last two weeks, and then it will be over. And then like uh, I accepted it now, and and I just uh, live with it, you know. And uh, uh, I, I know there is a. I think there is a wisdom to take out of what we're living right now, and. Uh, and I'm still trying to understand what is it. So, yeah. trying to reflect on the fact that I cannot do what I always used to do. <laughs> I can jump in for a sec. I've been really thinking a lot about the image, you know, image as intervention. So, like, Alcide's work is so powerful. You know, the image, you can't stop seeing that. You can't unsee it. So I've been thinking a lot about public art as intervention where you don't need people there, but you need that image. So what are you actually saying with that space? You know, I, you know, Banksy comes to mind, you know, challenge all the challenges we're experiencing in the world. The act of doing something is in the intervention and what we're saying to me is actually more important and getting that image to say that like, you know, we're standing for something. And when you put that out in a viral world, the dialogue that's coming is huge and it's going, things are, images are going viral. Like images are going viral, conversations are happening, people are sharing, social media is huge. You know, even the Black Square for Black Lives Matters, these things are really what's governing, you know, connection right now. So I feel like when I'm thinking about things, I'm always thinking about what's that image. It's not even about whether someone's there or not. You know, what am I saying? And, you know, how can I make it so compelling that it's an intervention that's standing for what's going on in the world right now? And then the connection will come after that if I use that uh, platform wisely. That makes wanna, sense. Yeah, totally it does. Do you want to talk a little bit about your um, monument, uh, your your virtual one, or is that like a clan? Is that a clandestine? <laughs> Oh, no, <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, for me during, uh, you know, the height of BLM, I wanted to do something, you know, I didn't want to just say something, I wanted to do something to contribute to the movement. And of course, monuments is such a massive issue right now, as, as always has been. And I just was sitting there and I was thinking about AR, I've been thinking about AR for a while, you know, as I saw, you know, major artists, you know, like Marina Abramovic and Cause and Anish Kapoor were playing with AR. And it was in my head. And when, you know, everything came up for BLM, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make an AR monument. And I just texted a friend of mine um, who works in Cognito. And I said, look, I have this idea. I want you to make it. And he said, okay, I'm with you. And he made it overnight. And the idea behind it was that it was democratizing monuments in a way that, and I hope that will really make it accessible to people as an intervention, because, you know, monuments are coming down, thank God, but it's going to be a while before new ones come out, you know, huge shout out to Quentin Bersetti, who's who got the Joshua Glover monument, but that takes time. So all of a sudden, I was like, what if monuments could be mobile? What if people decided, you know, when and how to bring it up? So for example, the BLM monument, you can literally pull it up at your boardroom table and the person on the, on the, on the other end won't even see it. But you snap that photo and you send that out and that way it gives the person agency. They can basically, you know, use, view, carry the monument with you and it also says that you're worthy. You're worthy of deciding when, how monuments are being pulled up. And what I loved about it was that, you know, I got a message from a friend of mine in Hong Kong and she said, thank you for giving me something that I can use to contribute to this movement. And she went to this like shore and she made this 
20 foot version of it. And it was her way, you know, of creating that monument. And I was like, this is the epitome of democratizing, you know, what monuments are in some ways. Janine, you should talk a little bit about, because you've talked lots about um, how, you know, when we do make permanent public artworks, which is what we've, you know, we talked a little bit about in the first panel in terms of the, the larger kind of um, issues around the destruction or taking down of the kind of monuments that we don't want. But even in our current society, like you've sat on uh, juries for public art, and the problem with public art is that you, especially if it has to last for a certain period of time, you can't make the kind of work that you necessarily want to make. And just how you're saying, I'm bringing like the project that you wanted was what you wanted it to be. And each person can take it up and, and recreate it in the space, however they, however they deem interested or how it moves them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when we make permanent artworks, um, you know, we're, we're bound by a whole bunch of rules. One, anti-graffiti. Two, the ideas around permanency. You know, is it going to last? What's the structure? What's the material? Um, is it going to invoke a riot? You know, this is, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, Janine, you want to pick up? Yeah, um, I do. I do think I said this at the beginning. I think we're we're in a transition right now where the idea of permanence is is really changing. We're we're in a world where we, we have living documents. Um, and where history itself is not seen as something that's simply stable, but something that can be transformed, that's changing, the past is changing to come and redefine paths into the future. Um, so I think, I, I do think it's quite clear that permanent uh, public art, some people are going to hate this statement, but anyway, um, you know, I think there's, I don't think there's any use for it. I think art can last for 10. 15 years and then that's it and we need new generations and new ideas and new materials the other thing is is having uh, been involved in a in a public art project for the city was it was very slow the artists couldn't do what they wanted to do because of all the bylaws certain materials can't be used and you know we're in a media media world as um was talking about the the ar you know, AR monuments, and there's all different kinds of ephemeral media that we can use and light um, that we can manipulate and sound, etc. But permanent public art um, has been devised in such a way that it's like it's stone, it's marble, it's something. Whereas I do think that artists are really redefining, redefining um, sculpture so that it does different things so that it is, it engages, it changes, it it can be revised. So that, I, that is why I'm, I'm less mournful and more hopeful for uh, what comes after. Yeah, I know, even as somebody who's made permanent public art, it is a struggle mentally and you, and, and I say that, you know, in, in two different hats, one curating permanent public art and then also the creation of it in my, as an, art, as an artist. And so there's so many challenges that you kind of go through and sometimes you're just given a little section and you're required to just create something, you know, in, in this little spot and you're just supposed to come up with an idea. And then sometimes, you know, you're, you're allowed a lot more freedom and you work with the designers and you work with the architects and you kind of, you know, play a little bit more organically with that space, right? Mazar, do you have some thoughts here? Listen, I, I think this is at the heart of what, what the Betway stands for. Right. Yeah. You know, the Bentway doesn't have a permanent piece of art and we've put on, I don't know how many art sort of performances, art shows. Um, I look at the, the, you know, the water leaf exhibit that we did, which was all video installation. We look at, you know, we've done, we've had dance, we've had sort of poster art, we've had, you know, sort of on and on and on. And I think that's really what, what has become sort of the, the, at the heart of the Bentway is this constant sort of pivot and challenge and sort of exploration of how space can sort of become this platform to express what is relevant in a moment of time and art as the voice that is sort of sending and sort of into delivering those messages. Um, so I, I completely agree with sort of the, the, the sort of the context of what's, what's sort of being discussed here and the fact that art, art as, a, as, a, as a means of communicating and not sort of a, a permanence that, that sort of becomes sort of marked in a moment in time. 
Um, and I think there is there is such a there is such a different sort of approach to it as not as sort of the, the monumentalization of art generally, with, whether it's hung permanently or whether it's cast permanently, but this the ability to for it to become a discourse in society about what is happening in the moment. Um, and I think that's really the, what what has been the magic of the Bentway and the work that's been happening at, uh, that we've been doing there. For sure, absolutely. Elsie, do you want to add some some final thoughts? We're getting close to wrapping up. I know we we started a little bit late, and uh, I really do apologize, but we all stay for a little bit longer. But it'd be great to hear some of your thoughts. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think I mean my as as an as an artist, uh, my my art is ephemeral by a sense. You know, so I uh, you know like this notions of this notion of having something permanent or not is not. Uh, is not what I'm looking at, you know, because uh, I I think art I use it as a pretext, you know, for something that is uh, greater. I'm really looking at the human experience, and I art is something that I use at a certain point to uh, yeah to connect with the with the different people and community where I go, and then uh, it's just the background of the story, you know, the art pieces will disappear. It was a vector of connection, and then it disappeared and. Uh, and sometimes people ask me like, oh, come on, you've worked on this like for so much time and then you don't care if it disappears. And uh, actually the fact that it will disappear is uh, is how we're gonna remember it, you know? And uh, there was this uh, Romanian French writer that I love called Eugène Ionesco. He said, uh, only the ephemeral lasts. And I think this, is, that's how I look at stuff because you, because for example, the mirror of Babel that we put in, uh, if if what we did like two years ago at Nuit Blanche would still be in the middle of Dundas, I think people will pass in front of it and don't even look at it. But the fact that it was there for a certain time and then we move it, you know, it was a kind of, oh, like we remember like two years ago, this was there, you know, and that's that's how, uh, that's the way I look at stuff. You know, I, I, I'm not attached to the fact that it's permanent or not. I think it's, it's, I like to see actually, uh, I like to see my work disappear. I don't know, it's a bit weird, but uh, I love to see that to f like when I do a painting to see them fading with time. I think there is a poetry in that and I love it. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's like there's this, the feeling and I think that this goes back to the idea of just what Janine said, bronze, marble, you know, the kinds of things that are supposed to last in time and we, you know, we look to, you know, the kind of like European uh, state to like, they dictated how we actually started to engage with public art, right? So we think of that kind of like longevity, because now when we go to certain cities, that's what we want to see and that what ends up being the tourist attraction. But in fact, you know, some of the work that's, you know, the, sometimes it's only 12 hours, you know, sometimes it's a couple months. And sometimes it's a few years and sometimes those that kind of engagement with that work can have such an everlasting feeling that you can't replicate by walking by the same bronze statue over and over again. And that's not to say that there, you know, that there isn't, you know, we've already had this debate on the first talk about whether brown statues should stay or not. But I do feel that we definitely we we have the ability to keep shifting and keep changing what what we what we can have access to. And I think on Breen's point around the, you know, the AR work that you can create that, you can share it globally, which we've never been able to do. And this will be the most exciting part about the virtual Nui is we'll be able to have a much more global uh, reach, which, you know, it, which we, you know, we've had, we have lots of people come out. It's, it's insane. It's just that, um, you know, people would have to travel to Toronto to experience it. And so now we have the opportunity to, to kind of reach outside of that. Any final words? I'm excited for this year's Nuit Blanche, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Well, one of the questions I guess we could leave with, like, why does public art matter in a post-COVID world? You know? So many reasons. <laughs> so many reasons like i've been thinking so much about the responsibility of public art you know it feeds your soul i yeah. really believe it feeds your soul you know imagine rc without it which we've pretty much had the last while and i feel a bit of emptiness you know and so 
I mean, I think that we have to use it responsibly. We have to use it to take care of people. We have to use it, like you said, to connect with people, um, to move us forward. I just, I just think that, you know, there's, it's, it serves such a large purpose for humanity. And now more than ever, you know, where we've all been at home and we're probably going to go into another lockdown. You know, I think that it's, it's serving, um, to really, I think it can really serve to name things, to make things better, to, you know, bring light to truths about, you know, anti-colonialism and all the things to talk about all the voices that were silenced. And there's so much power in this world, you know, that silences voices. So public art that's, you know, there for everyone to consume needs to serve a purpose that says that you matter. You know, especially as a city who, had, you know, we have that responsibility to always think about how do we serve people with it. And it's so integral now more than ever before um, to serve. I just, you know, I'm sad that um, Julian wasn't able to join us um, because I was thinking about this panel and I was thinking about um, his piece, uh, The Death of the Sun, that I worked on with him, Green. And that was, um, that was an incredible experience, you know? And if you think about public art as, I think it's like Durkheim called it collective effervescence, right? It's something that we all experience together. And it was really quite, we had no idea what the effect would be, especially when it blew away, what, you know, the day of the install, but it really had an effect. And then of course, you know, Drake saw it and it went on tour and everything, but it was just, you know, this ball that's about the, the end, the end of the sun, the end of our world, but it was very beautiful. And people, you know, it was the usual people lying around, but also, just I, I I had never experienced something like that at me with that kind of intensity and joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. People were feeling something like they we couldn't get them off the ground. They were like lying underneath yeah. it trying to. I think there were lots of makeouts for some weird reason. But, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it definitely served, you know. And Alcide's piece, which was this tower of Babel in the middle of our our Times Square, you know, I think people stood in awe and when they realized like the depth of the poem behind it, that it was actually an, an indigenous woman, she was talking about, um, I, I, I don't want to talk for you, I'll see, but like there's so many layers to the piece, it was, you could tell people felt like it was a gift, you know, and I think they really valued that. It was magic. It really was magical. Jeremy. Mazor or LC, did you guys want to have any last thoughts before we say goodbye? <laughs> As in public, public art, art in public space, it's the collective soul. Like yeah. it, just, it, it brings us all together. And, you know, in, in a time of isolation, um, we need that connectivity. And, and it's sort of, it's, our souls are really at the heart of who we are. That's our, it's, it's where, it's where we shine. And to be able to connect together, I think is the magic that public art does. Mm-hmm. That's true. I agree with that. You know, I'm just want to add one thing. You know, the Zoom project we did like a few, few months ago, uh, you know, I work with words, so I translate them in Arabic and I paint them with my style of calligraphy. I, I used this quote from this uh, this French writer who said, uh, art is, uh, is the shortest path from one human being to another human being. And, uh, and actually, like, uh, I feel this so relevant today. Well, it's because it speaks a language of emotion. I just want to say Mar Marcy and Chi Miigwech to you guys for, for coming and volunteering your time and energy and your incredible thoughts and uh, wisdom. And I just feel really honored and, and in such a privileged position to be able to get to have a 60 minute dialogue with you all. And I, I feel, um, you know, it, each time we get to do a talk, I get more and more excited about what's coming and thinking about the future. And I think that it's, it's providing hope you know, an excitement uh, for something, I don't know yet what, <laughs> but, it, but it's evolving and changing. 
I want to say uh, thank you to our continued support from our partners at the University of Toronto Scarborough and the Doris M McCarthy Gallery. And I want to recognize the support of the province of Ontario, Ontario Celebrate Program Grant. And um, I hope that everybody comes next Tuesday when we have our next talk on public engagement with outdoor festivals. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you guys for being here. And I really can't, uh, I can't express my gratitude enough. So thank you, especially for you, Will Seed. It's four in the morning. <laughs> no, we missed you. Full no. <laughs> oh, props, full oh, props. <laughs> thank okay. you, you guys. Thanks, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie.